Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adon Olam Messianic Congregation. Uh, we are glad to have you with us this evening uh, as we uh, just pray that you have had a blessed week. Uh, we also remember those who have uh, suffered tragedy in this past week, as uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, in the news, the uh, fires that have occurred on one of the Hawaiian islands and unfortunately uh, one of our own actually has a uh, dinner theater there uh, in that area that probably uh, has been burned all the way to the ground but at this point we're just praying for safety for all of the people who uh, were her employees and uh, we trust that uh, the Lord will be able to use this perhaps in ways that we can't see at this point, but in a way that will bring glory to him uh, and that uh, will even, uh, we hope in some way, be a blessing to uh, Lisa and her husband Warren as well. But we uh, have many things to be thankful for, uh, and we take this time, this weekly divine appointment that the Lord has established to meet with his people, uh, to reflect on the blessings of this past week, uh, and to come together for a sacred assembly in the Hebrew Mikra Kodesh, uh, a holy convocation, sometimes it is translated. And we just trust that you will be uh, blessed during this time. We uh, are here to proclaim the Jewishness of Messiah Yeshua, the Jewishness of our new covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is using Hebrew in our, some of the songs and some of the prayers but we will translate the Hebrew uh, in virtually every situation because uh, we want everybody to understand what is going on and we see ourselves as a community. Uh, the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, described in Ephesians chapter 2, Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. So we trust that this service will be a blessing to you this evening. At this time, I'm going to call up May Galloway uh, as we usher in the Sabbath in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candles that we will use a uh, messianic blessing uh, as we welcome in the Sabbath and you can direct your attention to the front at this time. Thank you, May. And now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Eli Scott, uh, and ask everyone to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. This prayer is based on Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, uh, as we spoke about last week. And in this prayer, uh, as once again, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the verses known as the Via Hafta, the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, which we will once again chant in Hebrew and then recite the English translation. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Vahed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God 
God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Asher Anuchi Metzacha Hayom Al Levavecha Veshinantam Levanecha Verevarta Pam Veshivtecha Bevetecha Uvlechtecha Vaderech Ushachbecha Uvkumecha Ushartam Leod Al Yadecha Vehayulet Otafot Vein Enecha Uchtavtam al mezuzot betecha uvisharecha beahavta lerecha kamocha. Amen. Together. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates and you shall love your neighbor as yourself amen please join me as we open our service in prayer Eloheinu, Velohavo, Tainu, Elohavraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Velohe Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to uh, gather together, Lord, uh, as a community, as we uh, come together, Lord, to lift up and proclaim the name of Messiah Yeshua, as we reflect on the blessings of this past week, uh, Lord, as we reflect on uh, the news that we heard about the events in Hawaii, Lord, uh, I just pray that uh, you would just use these uh, seeming tragedies, Lord, uh, to accomplish your purposes, that those who know you would draw closer to you, would sense your comforting presence, and Lord, that you would even be able to uh, reveal yourself in a new way to those who do not know you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for the many blessings that we experience. We thank you for this uh, opportunity to gather together as a community. We thank you for the blessing of uh, the new building in Greenville and those who are willing to uh, work to get it ready for us to be able to use for our services uh, at some point. And Lord, we just uh, ask you to bless this service. Uh, to reveal yourself in a uh, new and different way to all who are here, that we might draw closer to you, that we might be more conformed to the image of your Son. As, Lord, we seek your anointing on this service, on the singing, on the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship time afterwards, all that we do this evening, Lord. May, be, may you be lifted up and glorified through it. And, Lord, we just... Uh, dedicate this time to you and we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and now I'm going to call up Rebecca Haberman uh, to bring us our announcements for the week. <coughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Adonala Messianic Congregation. If you're a first time visitor this evening, Please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you've not yet received a visitor packet, please keep your hand raised so we can get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. And you'll also find a visitor's card which we would ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we're blessed to have you with us this evening. About a month ago, a Messianic congregation in Tennessee suffered a collapse of a wall in their fellowship area. We are going to provide an offering box in our fellowship area for the next couple of weeks for those who feel led to help out Rabbi Joe Bell and his congregation. 
Ari Yehuda, Lion of Judah Messianic Congregation in Bristol, Tennessee. You can make checks out to AOMC and write Bristol in the memo or write Bristol on the envelope if you're giving cash. We'll be continuing Tuesday's class on the subject of sharing Messiah with sensitivity. We're also having our beginning Hebrew class afterwards. All are welcome. And now we pray the Lord's blessing upon you. We hope that you'll feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us this evening. And once again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, this week will probably be the last week that we have uh, the offering for Joe Bell because we're probably going to, uh, and as I mentioned, we're not only taking up the offering for that congregation, but uh, congregationally, we're also going to uh, provide some support. And we'll probably do that um, for a congregation in Hawaii as well to try and help them out. Uh, it's just uh, trying to do a little something to have a part uh, in what the Lord is actually doing in the midst of these difficult situations, trusting that, as I said, he will be able to uh, reveal himself and accomplish his purposes. And now we will chant a traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. Uh, the Hebrew chant is the uh, Hebrew of Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Uh, and then afterwards, we will have the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added to the end, uh, basically reciting what uh, the New Covenant scriptures have to say uh, about Yeshua fulfilling various aspects. So now the Vishamru. Vishamru Together. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I will call forward our ARC opener, Randall Anderson, as well as Fred Scott, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask that as the ARC is opened, you would please stand 
The Ark is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll known as the Torah, which contains the first five books of the Bible known as the five books of Moses. The term Ark also reminds us of the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of the Lord dwelt. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God. Great is our Lord. Holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth are yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Brian, son of Yeshua, and Rebekah, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Ben Miko Hamim Venatam Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noteim HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 25th day of the fifth month on the Hebrew calendar of the month of Av. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Devarim. We'll be reading from chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, found on page 212 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Obey and pay attention to everything I am ordering you to do, so that the things will go well with you and with your descendants after you forever. As you do what I deny see as good and right, when I deny your God has cut off ahead of you the nations that are entering in order to dispose, and when you have disposed them and are living in their land, be careful. After they have been destroyed ahead of you, not to be trapped into following them, that you inquire after their gods and ask, how did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. You must not do this to I deny your God, for they have done to their gods all the abominations that Adonai hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah emet Vechai olam natah v'tocheinu Baruch atah Adonai, Noten HaTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Vezod HaTorah. Asher Samoshe, Lifne Bene Israel, Api Adonai, Beyad Moshe, 
before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from Isaiah chapter 54, verses 14 through 17. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yeshiahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 54, verses 14 through 17, found on page 523 in the Complete Jewish Bible. In righteousness you will be established, far from oppression, with nothing to fear. Far from ruin, for it will not come near you. Any alliance that forms against you will not be my doing. Whoever tries to form such an alliance will fall because of you. It is I who created the craftsman who blows on the coals and forges weapons suited for their purpose. I also created the destroyer to work havoc. No weapon made will prevail against you. In court, you will refute every accusation. The servants of Adonai inherit all this. The reward for their righteousness is from me. <clears throat> the blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, for speaking, then fulfilling. For all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful and fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. <laughs> Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Mashiach Yeshua, the Hadi Brochel Habrit Hadesha Baruch Hata Hanai No Tain Habrit Hadesha Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua in the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from Acts chapter 11, verses 4 through 10. Again, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 11, verses 4 through 10, on page 1375 in the Complete Jewish Bible. In reply... Kepha began explaining in detail what had actually happened. I was in the city of Yafro praying, and in a trance I had a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being lowered by its four corners from heaven, and it came down to me. I looked inside and saw four-footed animals 
beast of prey, crawling creatures, and wild birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Kepha, slaughter and eat. I said, no, sir, absolutely not. Nothing clean or <coughs> treff has ever entered my mouth. But the voice spoke again <coughs> from the heaven. Stop treating as unclean what God has made clean. This happened three times, and then everything was pulled back up into the heaven. At that very moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where I was staying. Amen. And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu haribar haedmet, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> for the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word and the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting He being merciful. He being merciful is iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiven and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. All right, and we have eight chapters to cover tonight, so we better get going. Um, <clears throat> at the end of last week's Torah portion in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 9, we find the Lord's reasons for choosing the Jewish people. And it certainly wasn't because of their large numbers. We're told, in fact, that they were the fewest of all peoples. The Lord said he chose them because of his love and his faithfulness to the promises he had made to their ancestors. He delivered the Jewish people out of slavery as another demonstration that he is the faithful God who keeps his covenant and extends his chesed, uh, often translated as loving kindness, to those who love him and observe his mitzvot, his commandments, to a thousand generations, which is probably 70,000 years, give or take. We don't think about that. But that demonstrates the faithfulness uh, of God, that, that statement. Uh, also, uh, this past week, uh, I had the opportunity to visit with uh, Ron Miller, a Jewish man. Uh, he and his wife used to attend our congregation faithfully, uh, and he is um, on home hospice at this point. And so uh, we want to remember uh, him in prayer and uh, as I've said before, we definitely want to pray um, for those who have suffered tragedy in various parts of the nation. I think there was even a young man in uh, Anderson uh, who was killed when a, a tree fell on him. So uh, none of us, I, I say this often because my rabbi uh, and my former synagogue, what I call the Eustagog, uh, used to say it, none of us is guaranteed our next breath. And that's why we need to be listening to the Lord, and that's why we need to spend time with Him. 
uh, even in prayer. So let us just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, uh, we are humbled as we uh, think about your power. We think about your blessings in our life. We think about the revelation that you have provided, uh, that we might uh, be able to see it as guidance for the challenges that we may face in the days ahead. And so, Lord, uh, as we seek truth from your word tonight, uh, we are blessed to know that it is an eternal truth. It is not uh, subjective, Lord, uh, and you have revealed it in love to your people. So uh, we just desire a greater understanding of your truths, that eyes would be open to see, ears would be open to hear, and hearts would be open to receive from you tonight. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. So I mentioned a chapter. It's because we're covering two Torah portions because uh, we needed to catch up to the calendar. A couple weeks ago, we had um, Bob Rivka and her husband, George, uh, and we fell behind by a week and last week we had too much so this is catch up week so um, <clears throat> to start out uh, I will tell you that last week's Torah portion is called a kev uh, which means because uh, it starts in Deuteronomy 712 uh, which it starts out because you shema uh, <clears throat> because you hearken you plural uh, this is a community statement. Because you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, uh, <clears throat> the Lord thy God shall keep unto you, once again, in the plural, the covenant, and the chesed, the loving kindness, which he swore to your fathers. We go on and we see blessings that will result from the, their obedience to the Lord, which include fruitfulness of the people, their livestock, and their land. The blessings also include protecting them from disease and giving them victory over their enemies. Uh, for about a month now, we've been going through the book of Deuteronomy, and we've pointed out that its layout is similar to a treaty of that time called a suzerainty treaty, executed between a conquering king and a suzerain and the subjects that he had conquered. We've been going through the section called the stipulations most recently, and one of the stipulations of this type of treaty is where the people, the conquered people, are to keep their copy of the treaty, and we find that in this portion in Deuteronomy 10, verse 2, Moses instructed by the Lord to keep the two stone tablets, where? In the holy ark. And in Deuteronomy 10, verses 15 and 16, the Lord tells the Israelites to change from their old ways, to no longer be stiff-necked, because they have been chosen by God from all other peoples. He tells them to circumcise the foreskins of their heart. And we read that, and, and I think sometimes we, we don't think about the fact the, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, which was circumcision, that was a, a physical uh, action that was carried out. But here, uh, the covenant that we're talking about is the Mosaic covenant, and yet the instructions that are given is that the people are to commit to this covenant as a uh, spiritual commitment, the circumcision of the heart by faith, is, uh, in essence. Uh, similarly to what Yeshua said in Yochanan John 14, verse 15, where he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And last week's Torah portion, that was pretty quick covering that, uh, closes out telling the Israelites in Deuteronomy 11, verse 24, wherever the sole of your foot treads, it will be yours. However, in Islam, there's a competing idea. They think that if a land has ever been under Muslim control, then it will always be Muslim land. So now we have a problem. We actually see this struggle playing out right before our very eyes as both God's people, the Jewish people, and the Muslims claim the land of Israel, claim the land that God has given to the Jewish people. For example, in Amos 9, verses 14 and 15, the Lord says through Amos, Yes, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. 
They will rebuild desolated cities and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will also make gardens and eat their fruit. Yes, I will plant them on their land and they will never again be plucked out of their land that I have given to them. It is my prayer that word this prophecy from uh, recounted by Amos, this revelation would provide comfort to our people dwelling in the land today. There are threats, they, they are constantly threatened with annihilation, yet the Lord says they will not be uprooted again. And I believe that that is exactly going to be the case. That doesn't mean there won't be struggles and battles, that means that God is fighting on their side. This week's Torah portion starts out talking about blessings for obedience. Uh, and we also find, in this case, curses for disobedience. The portion is called Ra'eh and goes from Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 through chapter 16, verse 17. Now, Ra'eh means see. In one of the songs that we sang earlier, uh, there's a term that uh, Abraham actually named a place. Uh, in the English, it's frequently pronounced as Jehovah Jireh. In Hebrew, in the song we sang, sang it was Adonai Yireh. And sometimes that's translated as um, the Lord, my provider, but it really means the Lord will see to it. And the root of Yireh is the same as the name of this portion, Re'eh. Um, it, which we are translating in verse uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 26, as C. And it goes on to say, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you shema, if you hearken to the commandments of the Lord. But as we see in the next verse, Deuteronomy 11, verse 28, the people would experience curses if they failed to shema, if they turned away from the commandments if they fell into idolatry by going after other gods. People often claim the blessings for themselves and they ignore the fact that frequently the blessings were given with the idea that if you fail to do what you've been instructed to do, you're going to experience curses as well. Uh, it's convenient to grab hold of the blessing, but we have to realize that God has a system where he motivates us through a uh, concept of desiring to bless us, but sometimes in our own best interest, uh, we have to experience the rod of chastisement. Uh, we have to experience the uh, negative effects of our actions so that we might repent, so that we might turn to God and seek after him with all of our heart and not go astray as our people so often did into idolatry. Even though they had the king of the universe dwelling in their midst, they had the, the God of all gods dwelling amongst them, and yet they were looking around and the shiny object was what the nation seemed to have that they didn't. They had everything you could want, but they saw that there were things that were going to end up creating problems for them, and nonetheless, that's what they repeatedly went after. And I used to struggle with this, because uh, we claim all the good things that, that the Jewish people do. When a Jewish person does well, we're like, yeah, he's one of us. But in this case, we read over and over in the Hebrew scriptures of their falling into idolatry, the ultimate act of rejection of their creator. And I realized recently, actually, that every time we read those words, it's actually a blessing. Because the more faithless the Jewish people are presented as, the more faithful God yeah. is presented as, as he remains faithful to them despite their waywardness, which should be an encouragement to us because uh, we can just as easily buy into the lies of this world, seek after its trophies. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we find a discussion of the significance of blood. The Israelites are told that they can kill animals for food, but they're warned in Deuteronomy 12 verses 23 and 24 that they are not to eat any of the blood. Uh, instead, they're to pour it out on the ground. 
And, you know, it's one thing to avoid eating it, but, but pouring it onto the ground. Deuteronomy 12, verse 23, it says, because the blood is the nephesh, which is usually translated as the soul. Uh, we find a similar concept in Vayikra Leviticus 17, verse 11, which says, the soul, the nephesh of the flesh is in the blood which I have given to you upon the altar to bring atonement for nafshotechem, for your souls. Uh, for it is the blood that brings atonement for the soul. We see this connection uh, between blood and atonement. Hebrews 9 verse 22 in the New Covenant Scriptures uh, tells us every, nearly everything is purified with blood. Uh, most likely referring to the uh, purification ritual that we find in Leviticus 16 that takes place on the Day of Atonement when the various items that are in the tabernacle have to be purified and blood is sprinkled on them to purify them. It goes on to say, uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And 1 John 1.7 uh, tells us, as we just said, we recite every Friday, it is the blood, the blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, that cleanses us, that purifies us from all sin. And so th this uh, emphasis on the blood points us to the blood that would be shed in Messiah's sacrifice so that we might have not only forgiveness for sin, but even a restored relationship with the creator of the universe, our Heavenly Father. As we continue in this week's portion, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, we find a repetition of the dietary laws found in Leviticus 11. That explains our New Covenant reading uh, earlier, which we'll talk about in just a moment. The Lord had designated for various reasons certain animals as clean, as appropriate for eating. Uh, the term that we use in, in traditional Judaism is the foods that are kosher. Other animals are uh, deemed unclean for various reasons. The Hebrew is tameh, and in Yiddish it's treif, which is uh, how Stern referred to them in the reading that we had earlier. Deuteronomy 14 verse 6 tells us that animals that both chew their cud and have split hooves are kosher. Uh, De Deuteronomy 14 verse 9 says that for a fish to be fit for eating, it must have, must have both fins and scales. And in Messianic Judaism, we often refer to eating based on these instructions as keeping biblically kosher. Uh, that's why we ask people to avoid bringing pork and shellfish to our congregational events. But uh, there's also something called rabbinic kosher which has additional requirements based on wording found in Deuteronomy 14, verse 21, a verse I often cite for a different reason. But the final part of the verse says, you are not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And from this statement, which is uh, found two other times in uh, other places in the Torah, the rabbis have added a requirement that meat and dairy are not to be eaten at the same time. Actually, you need separate dishes uh, for them. They're not mixed in any way. But once again, that, that's rabbinic, and most messianics do not uh, add that requirement unless they're seeking to minister in an orthodox neighborhood. Uh, because sometimes we don't want to offend, and we need to be aware of how the particular Jewish group that we're trying to reach uh, lives out their Jewish identity. And that's one of the things we've been talking about on Tuesday nights. Uh, we've been uh, helping people to understand that you really can't say that, that the Jewish people are always a certain way because there's really a spectrum from those who are atheistic and secular they don't believe in God and they only observe their Jewishness in a cultural sense, all the way to the Orthodox who uh, sometimes have added numerous additional requirements uh, based on commentaries of the rabbis and that sort of thing. 
but we want to be able to minister to them because Romans 1.16 talks about, uh, Rabbi Shaul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah. It is the power of God unto salvation. That's the message we bring, the power of God unto salvation. It goes on to say, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we feel like the Lord has given us a building in Greenville so that we might be able to more effectively minister to the Jewish community of Greenville. And we are seeking an understanding uh, of how they tend to view things. Now I want to talk about the first part of Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. It's talking about an animal that has died naturally uh, of itself, sometimes it's translated. It says that the Israelites are not to eat it, but then there's two other options. They may give it to the gare, the sojourner, within their gates, or it can be sold to a nohri, a foreigner. Note here that the sojourner and the foreigner are treated differently. The animal may be given to the sojourner or sold to a foreigner. And frequently we know, those who have been coming for any length of time, that sojourner is often translated as outsider, sometimes even foreigner, which creates a lot of confusion. But here we see the difference between one who is dwelling in the midst of the community and one who is completely outside the community, the foreigner. We also find uh, the passage that talks about keeping kosher, I, I referred to it earlier, in the New Covenant Scriptures. It's actually an event that takes place in Acts chapter 10, but I decided to read it from Acts chapter 11. Uh, one, just a different approach, but secondly, this is Peter's recounting of this vision that he has seen. Uh, because many in the believing world see this vision as revealing that the laws of clean and unclean with regard to food have been done away with. Uh, and in fairness to uh, those in the believing world, there are those in the Jewish community. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, largest Jewish denomination or sect uh, in the United States is the reform group, uh, the, the reform denomination. And um, they, generally speaking, do not see the kosher laws as being applicable anymore today. Uh, so um, many have decided these uh, instructions are no longer valid uh, for us in, in the modern world. But if they're justifying it based on what Peter is saying, uh, which isn't the Jewish people, it's generally uh, people from a church background, Let's see what Peter had to say. Um, in Acts 10, verse 28, Peter says that God has shown him through this vision that he is not to call anyone unholy or unclean. And in Acts 11, Peter's come to Jerusalem after he's had this vision. They've heard about uh, certain events that have taken place, and he is being accused of eating with the uncircumcised eating with the Gentiles. And in responding to them, Peter gives them a blow-by-blow, point-by-point description of what he has seen in this vision from the Lord. He tells them he saw a sheep with all kinds of unclean animals on it coming down from heaven. And he heard a voice saying, kill and eat. But instead of doing what he was told, Peter refused. Uh, his Hebrew name is Kepha. Uh, that's the, term, the name you heard for him earlier when we read. He refuses, saying, Certainly not, for never has anything unholy or unclean entered my mouth. And then Peter says he heard a voice from heaven saying, What God has made clean, you must not call unholy. And this happens two more times. But one of the things that people ignore is what Peter told them in Acts 11, verse 10. He says that everything was pulled up to heaven. He didn't eat any of Well, that was supposed to be my question. I'm supposed to ask, did Peter eat from the unclean sheep? And the answer is no. And in explaining the vision, he's not talking about food. He says the vision is about Gentiles. In Acts 11, verse 15, he says... The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, fell on them just as on us. 
in Acts 11, verse 17, he says, If God gave them the same gift he gave us after we had put our trust in Yeshua the Messiah, who was I to stand in God's way? In Acts 11, verse 18, we find that those who had just accused him of eating with Gentiles are now praising the Lord. And why is that? They're not praising the Lord because the kosher laws have been done away with and now they can have a ham sandwich. They're rejoicing at what Peter had revealed to them, that God had shown him something we have no doubt about today, that those from the nations, the Gentiles, also could have the opportunity to repent and to receive eternal life. And upon closer examination, we find out that the scriptures reveal that the dietary laws are connected to the concept of holiness. Uh, when we read about them, first it, the instructions are, you are to be holy, you are to be holy ones because I am holy. And holiness is not a one-time decision, it's actually a process that we go through as we are being sanctified, as we are being purified from the contamination of this world to be used for the Lord's purposes. We're more and more being set apart, that's what holy means, uh, from the world. But our flesh never wants to be set apart, it always wants to fit in. And of course we understand as members of a messianic congregation, we are going to be set apart from the world. We're even gonna stand out amongst our fellow believers in the church world. And I would say to those of you uh, who were not raised Jewish, but who are a part, you've chosen to be a part of the Messianic Jewish community. Uh, you've chosen to be sojourners uh, in the midst of this community. I appreciate your willingness to sojourn alongside God's chosen people, because that means you get to where often you will end up wearing the same bullseye that we wear as far as the world and the enemy of our souls is concerned. You know, Yeshua said, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. The persecution that the Jewish people have suffered throughout our history is why many do not live out their Jewish identity today. So now I'm going to quiz you a little bit on some well-known Jewish people who changed their name in the last century, uh, perhaps so they could hide or de-emphasize their Jewish identity. For example, you've all heard of the longtime Jewish comedian, Jacob Cohen, right? Rodney Dangerfield. There you go, Rodney Dangerfield. Okay, so one person had. Um, how about Francis Gum? Anybody ever heard of Francis Gum? That's uh, Judy Garland. Oh, didn't know that. Uh, folk singer Robert Zimmerman, I'll bet more of you know this one. Bob, Bob, Bob Dylan, okay. Uh, how about comedic actor Arya Rosenberg? I didn't even know this one. Um, I discovered it doing it. Tony Randall uh, of Odd Couple fame. At times, our people have been forced, and in more recent times, simply went along with trying to fit in with the rest of the world. But as I often say, trying to fit in with the world and serve the Lord, uh, he said that the flesh is at enmity with the spirit, that what this world will do for us is chew us up, spit us out, and invite us back for more of the same. It may seem like our friend for a short time, but ultimately we will find out what this world is like, and this world can be very cruel. Uh, it, it acts in its own self-interest. It's based on selfishness. And so <clears throat> we, we have to uh, spend time with the Lord in prayer, reading his word, and, and be able to experience the joy of being in the presence of the Lord. And the more time we spend with him, the less we will be tempted by the trophies that this world offers. The scriptures have called us to stand out, to maintain a distinctiveness as the people of God. Jews and Gentiles have a distinctiveness as well, but nonetheless, we are all called to be holy for his purposes. Deuteronomy chapter 14 also deals with tithing. In Deuteronomy 14 verse 23, we find that the tithe is to help us to learn to fear the Lord our God always. It's easy 
to give out of abundance. And the Lord doesn't really ask for much. The Hebrew word uh, taser means one-tenth. But the reality is that it is an act of trusting in him and acknowledging that he is the source of all of our blessings. As it was originally set up, the people were to bring the tithe of their harvest and their animals year by year to a place of the Lord's choosing. And there they would even um, consume the tithe uh, along with the priests. But if the place was too far away, the tithe could be converted to money to purchase food and drink to be consumed in the presence of the Lord. And according to Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29, every third year the tithe was to go to the Levites and the sojourners and the fatherless and the widows, those who were unlikely to be able to provide for themselves. And uh, the version that we're putting up, the uh, TLV, the Tree of Life version, translates the Hebrew word that we're, tra ger, that we're translating as sojourner, it uses the term the outsider. And I think um, a lot of times it's the outsider within your gates and so, or the outsider who is sojourning with you. And so you can figure out that it's really talking more about a sojourner. But if it doesn't have that additional statement of the one that is with you, it sounds like uh, we're to take care of the entire world when the reality was the Lord provided for a community that was to demonstrate his faithfulness to the rest of the world. Sometimes we bless the world as we seek to bring the message of God's unconditional love to them. But we have to realize that his instructions are really provided for a uh, group, of p a community that is composed of Jew and Gentile worshiping together as one. Here in our uh, congregation, we tithe on all of the donations that we receive. We give to ministries that help the poor in Israel, Ethiopia, Ukraine, Belarus, and here in our local community as well. We give to groups such as Miracle Hill and the Emergency Relief Center here in Piedmont. And we also support other Messianic ministries that seek to uh, bless the Jewish people. In Deuteronomy 15, we come across a concept called the Shemitah. Let's say that together. Shemitah. Um, Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn has a book called The Mystery of the Shemitah. The word Shemitah means release. Uh, and actually, it's first mentioned here in Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 3, uh, as a release from any debt that has been occurred once again within the community. It says that if a foreigner... Uh, has incurred debt, you may require that he repay it. But here, for somebody who has incurred debt, they can essentially go into indentured servanthood to pay it off. And the most interesting thing about that is that every seven years, the debt is canceled, even if it hasn't been completely paid off. Because the Lord did not want people to see debt as something that they couldn't get out from under. Uh, he always provides hope. And we even see in the Shemitah a shadow of the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua. He paid off a debt that we are unable to pay. The penalty of death that we owe because of our sin. Actually, we are able to pay it. We don't want to pay it. No amount of money is sufficient to pay off our debt. But his sacrifice provides the Shemitah as we are released from our sin debt to the king of the universe. Yeshua paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. Deuteronomy 16 also talks again about bringing an offering to the Lord, this time in the context of what are referred to as the traveling festivals. Uh, according to Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, there were three times during the year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, where the, when the Jewish people were to appear before the Lord in the place of his choosing, which eventually became uh, first the tabernacle and then the temple in Jerusalem. And it says they were not to appear before the Lord empty-handed. Deuteronomy 16, verse 17 says, each man is to give according to the blessing that the Lord God has provided. Now, we've been uh, talking about how the uh, readings are connected to the events
that have taken place uh, on the Jewish calendar. That several weeks ago, it was the 9th of Av. Uh, right now, I think we said it's the 25th of Av. Uh, and uh, the 9th of Av is the day, it's called Tisha B'Av in the Hebrew. Uh, the number nine is Tisha. Um, on that day, both the first and second temples were destroyed. And so prior, the three, in the three weeks prior to that uh, anniversary, we read portions from the Haftarah, portions from the prophets that remind us that the Jewish people uh, were not faithful like they should have been, as I talked about earlier. And that could very well be the reason, and we even saw verses that flat out stated that that was indeed the reason that the Lord had allowed the first, uh, first temple to be destroyed. But then in the seven, ver seven weeks afterwards, the rabbis uh, select passages that are referred to as the Haftarot. Uh, and Haftarah simply means completion. It's the ending portion that's read in the synagogue. But the uh, Haftarot in the plural of consolation. Uh, words where we find out that even though there is chastisement, even though there is uh, conviction, and even though there is an accounting for the sins, the, the, for the, the uh, faithlessness of the people, uh, that the Lord stands ready to take his people back. That his faithfulness always will exceed their faithlessness. Uh, no matter how much they reject him, he still stands willing uh, to remain faithful to the promises that he has made to them. And so we uh, have been going through this series, and this week we're on the third Haftarah of Consolation. It's Isaiah 54, 11 through 55, verse 5. Uh, and uh, in the reading for this week, we find great words of consolation. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And frequently, individual believers who are going through a time of struggle where they feel like they are being persecuted will say, Lord, I know that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And the reality is this chapter has been talking about the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. Isaiah 54, verses 7 and 8 say, For a brief moment I deserted you, but I will regather you with great compassion. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness. With everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Verse, seven, verse 11 talks about her stones and foundations. Verse 12, her windows and gates and walls. So maybe instead of saying, the Lord has promised to me that no weapon formed against me will prosper, we would say the Lord has told his people Israel, the Jewish people, that no weapon formed against them will prosper, and I believe that that can apply in my life as well. Isaiah 55 verse 1 invites, as we also sang earlier, all who are thirsty to come and drink. Now this is using poetic language to give an invitation to salvation through Messiah Yeshua. And according to Isaiah 55 verse 5, it will be extended to those from the nations. Just what Peter saw uh, in his vision. There was an understanding uh, in the first century that all of Israel would be saved and then the gospel would go out to those from the nations. But the reality is um, God's plan all along was for Jew and Gentile individually to be able to experience salvation through the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua. There's no other way of salvation. There's no name under heaven by which men must be saved. Yeshua said something similar to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 14, verses 13 and 14. He said, everyone who drinks from this water, uh, just referring to regular well water, will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. The water that I give him will become a fountain of water within him, within him springing up to eternal life. This is the blessing that we have experienced in the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. 
Uh, we should not take it for granted. This is what enables us to spend the rest of eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous God. It isn't because we are better than others. Because if you look at this world, there are those in the world whose deeds may well be better than ours. But the reality is this is the way God has said we can be seen as righteous. We see it pictured in the sacrificial system where a blemish-free animal would take on the sins of the one who brought it as a sacrifice. And the uh, untainted, unblemished uh, state of the animal would be transferred to the one who, would, who had brought it. And we would be able to be seen as righteous in God's sight. That's the system that he set up. And I'm thankful for it because the reality is all too often our, our flesh is able to convince us that we should do something even when we know it's not what God would have us to do. That we will listen to our flesh instead of our spirit. But in reality, I am able to be seen as righteous because I have gone to the Lord and said, Lord, I accept the sacrifice that you have provided, the way, the truth, and the life, Messiah Yeshua. And in him, I can be seen as righteous in your sight. I realize there's nothing that I could do to obtain that, and I am sorry for all the different ways that I have rebelled against your ways. And I ask you to help me to be more of the servant that you would have me to be. Help me to have victory over the sins that so easily uh, create temptation in our lives. And so uh, in this case, we give everybody the opportunity to uh, make a choice to receive Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf. And so I would ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, you've never accepted his sacrifice on your behalf before, but you now realize that you can drink from a well that will never run dry. Uh, the Lord has provided the only way that we can have our sins forgiven, the only way that can, we can be seen as righteous. So if you've never done it before, but you feel the Lord leading you to do this tonight, I would just ask you to raise your hand and say to your creator, I am ready to do things your way. So often we, we try to lean on our own understanding, but the reality is God in his grace has given us the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive. And he gives it to us for free. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I want to receive it. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity, and we also have uh, the services go out on YouTube video. And so uh, if you are watching on the video and you uh, want to raise your hand, I would encourage you to do that right now. And you can uh, call the congregation and, and let us know, and somebody will pray with you. But we also find in the message tonight that it's not just a message for unbelievers. Uh, those of us who have already accepted Yeshua, uh, we may have come to understand something that we didn't understand before. Uh, maybe you've come to understand Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 in a new way. And you want to understand the dietary laws, what they would teach you about the holiness of God. Uh, and so um, perhaps you uh, just want to ask the Lord to help you to better understand that in the days ahead, to be able to think more about what we're eating and his instructions regarding eating. Maybe you now realize that as believers, <clears throat> we can't just live any way we want and expect the Lord's blessing, that our blessings come from being obedient to his instructions. Or maybe you didn't understand that the tithe is the way that the Lord has established to acknowledge him as the source of all of our blessings and to learn to fear the Lord our God always. So if you're wanting to make a change in one of these areas or some other area that the Lord may have shown you this evening, I would just ask you to be obedient to what he has shown you. And you can even raise your hand as a sign of your commitment so that from this day forward, there will be no doubt that you said, yes, Lord, you have shown me this and I desire to act in accordance with your will. Lord, I want to say by raising my hand, not my will be done, but your will be done for your glory and for your honor. As Lord, we desire your will for our lives. 
We want to stop being servants of this world and to serve you and you alone as we offer up to you the first fruits of our lives uh, in the form of the tithe, as we acknowledge you as the source of all of our blessings. And we ask you to make us vessels fit for your service as you continue to conform us to the image of your son, Yeshua. And Lord, we thank you for your blessing in our lives and we thank you for the gift of salvation. And we just thank you that we can uh, come before you, Lord, and acknowledge all these things. And we ask all of these things, we acknowledge all these things. In the name of your son, Yeshua, and all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. I hope that you have a great week ahead in the Lord. Now I'm going to call our cantor back up as we will pronounce uh, blessings that are traditionally recited at the end of the service. One blessing is uh, sanctifying the service, setting it apart, uh, making it holy unto the Lord. Uh, and the second blessing is acknowledging him for his provision. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, Borei puri Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And L'chaim, we know, is a traditional toast that means life. And the Lord tells us to choose life. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, hamosi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and honor and fruit from the earth. Amen. I forgot that I decided last week that we were saying all those together. Did anybody remember that? I remember. Okay. <clears throat> Just didn't want us to make too much of waves if the rabbi's forgetful, which uh, I think all of us can identify at times that we're not thinking everything we think that we want to right at the moment. But right now we are going to have the opportunity to receive words of blessing uh, that are the Lord's own words found in Numbers chapter 6. So I'd encourage everyone to please stand uh, as we pronounce these words of blessing over you. <laughs> Ya er Adonai panavalecha, pichunecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha, peyasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Before we sing our closing song, I need to address the elephant in the fellowship area, which is the three uh, large TV boxes. Uh, they've been purchased for our new building, but one of them's going to go up right here uh, as soon as we can stand the heat in the attic uh, to install the mount. So um, <clears throat> that's why they're there, and, and uh, they may be moving around, but uh, for the moment, you have to reach around them to get to our materials table. Now we're going to have our closing song. It's where we get the name of our congregation. Uh, it's the Adon Olam. We'll sing it in the Hebrew, just like I did in the synagogue growing up. And then we'll sing it in the English afterwards, just like I didn't do in the synagogue growing up. So you'll know what we just sung, the Adon Olam. Adon Olam, Asher
Thanks to everyone who had a part in the service. Enjoy the time of fellowship. Have a great week in the Messiah. Uh, by the way, uh, we're not having work days because it's supposed to be in the mid to upper 90s this weekend. So we're going to wait till it gets a little cooler. Uh, but we appreciate everybody's help. Have a great week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.